going. Good. Hey, by the way, thank you all so much for listening. Because I walk out, sometimes you'll see me just bouncing around like a rabbit outside when people are parking. And man, there's like... 20 cars up here in the old graded out racetrack. There's like 20 cars across the street at the bank. So thank y'all for making room for for people. I I really appreciate that. Um, For those of you who don't know me, this is your first time. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are are in our 12th week of navigating verse by verse uh, through the book of Acts. And there's several reasons why I love uh, the book of Acts. Number one, it is the uh, critical source It is the history book where we get the majority of our information about the rest of the letters that Paul wrote, uh, a lot of things that coincide with church history. And so the other reason is, is it is the book, honestly, that helped give us the vision here at Hendersonville Church. Because the question has always been at Hendersonville Church, take, take everything, strip everything out, strip it all out. Can we honestly act like the church in Acts? Can we do it? And and while we don't have the persecution, and we're going to learn why persecution, honestly, is so important for church biblical growth, you're like, whoa, what's he talking about? We're going to learn that today, but absent the persecution, can we do it? Can we take our comforts and our pleasures and our pride, and can, can can we put it aside and honestly put Christ first? I mean, can we do it? Can we truly do it? Because if we do, we will be misunderstood and we will look different. Just like Stephen did last week. He preached one of the greatest sermons ever in church history. He clearly and concisely and definitively showed the most powerful religious lead in the known world how the entire Old Testament from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the 12 patriarchs to Joseph to Moses to Joshua to King David to Solomon to all the prophets, all of that pointed to and was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He proved it unequivocally. So they drug him out to town, more than likely threw him down in a pit and hurled rocks at him and killed him. That's what he got for it. And so we're going we're gonna to learn today what happened as a result of that because the religious elite, they were done with it. They're like, man, we thought we got rid of Jesus when we crucified him. Then he raises from the dead. No one's ever done that like that. And then all of a sudden, he's got these followers that, that talk with such wisdom, it makes no sense. They perform unbelievable miracles that makes no sense. They've got a huge following. Let's just stamp it out. Let's get rid of it. And so what I want us to always have in the back of our head as we navigate through the book of Acts is Acts 1-8, because here's the deal. The followers ask Jesus, hey, Rabbi, is it time for you to set up the kingdom so we can go lay the smack down on the Romans and the Greeks and the Assyrians and all of them? And this is what Jesus says to them in Acts 1-8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, listen to these next several words. And then all Judea and Samaria, which we'll talk about why that would have blown their minds, and to the end of the earth. You notice how Jesus doesn't tell them to do anything there? He doesn't tell them to do anything. I talk to people all the time. Well, I can do better. I can, I can be in the word. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not about that. Jesus doesn't tell them to do anything. He says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit and be my witnesses. There is no doing. We're going to talk about that specifically today. So last week, we we briefly recapped how uh, Stephen uh, was, was murdered. And so now we're going to look, and we're going to cover the first 25 verses of, of chapter 8. And um, there's, some, there's some tough verses here. Uh, a lot of people don't preach on this because it brings up a lot of question marks. Uh, you've got certain denominations that, that literally have fought over the interpretation of what we're going to read, okay? And so we're going we're gonna to quickly dissect that, and we're going to help explain it so we can walk out of here understanding it. Um, but basically, remember this guy named Saul, and he was the one that approved of young Stephen. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start in 8.1, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, and Saul approved of his execution, and there arose... On that day, so the very day that they murdered Stephen, 
on that day, a great persecution against the church or a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of what? Judea and Samaria, just like Jesus told them. Now, it's probably not how they wished it would have happened, but they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. The apostles were like, we're going to stay back in Jerusalem. And then devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So a couple quick things here. Number one, it was on that day. The persecution came very fast and very strong. Instantly, certainly the early church was not expecting this to happen the way it did. There's no way. And so the other thing is, the cool thing where it says scattered, it's the same Greek word that's used as a farmer to sow seed. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I thought it was. To sow seed, so things grow. And so here's the cool thing, what you can start to notice is the history of the church start to literally unfold and Jerusalem and the temple law and the temple starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. Not that they're any less important. They're hugely important. They're hugely important because they were fulfilled in Jesus. So please don't misunderstand me there. The temple and the law and the 2,000 years from Abraham up to the temple was, was super important because it showed us our dire need for Jesus Christ. Okay, but you can start to see it be a smaller and smaller dot in the rearview mirror. So now they're going to uh, Samaria. And we're gonna get to that in just a moment because we've got to honestly know the context of Samaria to be able to appreciate these verses. The men that made great lamentation for him, it was illegal. The the, the Jews had had an extra biblical document called the Mishnah. And in that document, it says it is illegal to mourn an executed criminal. So these men that mourned and made great lamentation for Stephen would have certainly been flying in the face of the religious elite. And so they were putting their lives in dire straits just by having great lamentation for Stephen. So here's the thing. They stone one of the greatest servants in the church. The church is scattering. Saul is literally going house by house, having them dragged off to prison. That Greek word there is a violent dragging. And they scatter. What do you think they do? Go run, hide in a cave? Do you think they go and to the next country and ask for assistance? This part is mind-blowing. Here's the, th- here's the deal, folks. This is the church. Look at the very next verse in verse four. And those who were scattered went about doing the very thing that got them persecuted to begin with. The very thing, preaching the word. Again, there's that word scattered, to sow seed. And really, that that Greek word there is a little different than the one we're going to hear in the next verse. That, That one means literally just to share what has literally transpired. That's what these people were doing. They were all they were doing was they were going out into all these other regions, in addition to Jerusalem, simply telling people what happened. That's all they were doing. And they were tying it all back to the person and work of Christ Jesus. But what a phenomenal thing that is that when they knew the very thing that got one of their leaders, I mean, we've honestly, we've got to visualize how horrible a stoning is at that time. I mean, they would literally, they would, there would be like, I read of like competitions where they would, they would strip their clothes down to their waist because it was such a workout. And they, would, they toss Stephen almost every single time they toss him down the deep hole. And that would hurt him bad enough. That would probably, they were hoping that would break their legs because then they couldn't dodge the rocks. And they would take, the, they start with the big boulders and they just go, and start just to mash his head or break his ribs or break his hips. And these people are watching that happening. We need to visualize that. Because so many times I hear people saying, well, the church in America is being persecuted. Give me a break. We may lose our 501c3 status. Well, I guess we'll find out who the real followers of Jesus are, won't we? I guess we will. 
But we got to imagine that. And that's what they saw. And the first thing they do when they go to a foreign land, they're refugees in a foreign land, the first thing they do is preach the word. Here's the thing, folks. The, the church, it doesn't search for truth. It proclaims it. We proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, regardless of the consequences. That's what we're supposed to do. Here's the thing. Satan's, his, his agenda, his persecution promoted the very thing he was trying to stamp out. It's a beautiful way the Holy Spirit works us all out. Now look at the next verse. So we introduced to a guy named Philip. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now this is not Philip the apostle for two reasons. One, Philip is grouped in with Stephen when they select the men to help administer for the church. And two, it says all the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So this was Philip the servant. Okay, not the apostle. So basically, he's traveling 40 miles north, and again, didn't have a Lexus or a Honda or a Toyota. Okay, he, he's on foot. If he's, if he's very fortunate, he has a donkey with him. But he's on foot 40 miles, okay? And so he's going to Samaria. Now, we need to pause for just a moment because it is absolutely necessary we understand the historical context of Samaria. I cannot stress enough the despise that the Jews had for Samaria that went back almost 800 years between kings and intermarrying. And basically the Jews looked at the Samarians as basically a mongrel nation of half-breeds. One of the most beautiful, quite possibly the most beautiful encounter that Jesus had with anyone was a Samarian woman at the well. And not only was she, was, was she Samarian, she was a woman, and, and women were so ill-treated back then, so ill-treated. And, and, and Jesus sees her. And thirdly, we find out from Jesus she had been married five times, and she was at the well by herself, which meant she was an outcast. Jesus goes to her. His followers at the time were blown away that he would even talk to a, a woman that was from Samaria. Nothing you would ever see a rabbi do in those days. Never see a rabbi do that. He tells her everything. She goes back to the village. She testifies. She witnesses about Jesus. And we learn from scriptures that people come to know Jesus through her testimony. But Jesus wanted to make sure we knew that no one is undeserving of the gospel. No one. And so when Jesus would have said way back in Acts 1-8, Judea and Samaria, the disciples been like, what? Nah, we ain't going to do this. This is just for the Jews, man. No way, Rabbi. There's no way that can happen. He's like, oh, trust me. And so we see these Samarians. And so basically, they, they, it wasn't uncommon for the Jews to pray to God for him to not remember the Samarians when the resurrection happened. It was a common prayer that a Jewish man would say that I thank you, I'm not a despised Samaritan. That's why I love the good Samaritan parable as well. So we gotta make sure we understand that. You cannot, I'm telling you, there's not a hatred that's going on in the world today. I, I, think, I think that radical uh, Islam and maybe Orthodox Jews, maybe that's close, but I'm telling you, the hatred that the Jews had with the Sumerians and vice versa was unfathomable, okay? And so listen what happens when Philip starts doing this in verse six. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so that there was what? Much joy in that city. Now, what was, what was Philip's big strategy? Okay, I'm gonna, okay, so Saul's persecuting the church. I tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna walk 40 miles and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to do this, and then there's going to be much joy in the city, and I'm going to keep going, and I'll go to this one, this one. No, no, he, he, he loved Jesus. And he couldn't help but tell people about him. You know, it's funny. I, I, I get criticized sometimes for, for the perceived lack of strategy we have here at Hendersonville Church. Like I've been asked, well, you know, what's your, what's your social media strategy? I, we just put our messages on Facebook Live and we'll try to do the worship set. If we got an announcement, we'll make it. Okay, yeah, but do you, what about your boost strategy? How, how do you do that? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, but we just pray for God to send people. The bank, with us trying to pay off this, buy this building. They're like, so Nathan, what's your, what's your campaign strategy? 
Tell me about your capital campaign. Ah, yeah, we're, we're praying at Jesus. And they're like, no, 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 what, what's, your, what's, literally, what's your capital campaign? I'm like, ah, we're, well, we, don't, we don't have one. I said, you're talking about like the little chart that looks like a thermometer and it goes up as people give? Like, yeah, 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 that. I'm like, yeah, we're not doing that. I said, if God wants us to own this building, he will bring the money. And here's the thing. In the year and a half we've done this, I've never asked anyone for a dime. Never. I'm like, look, here's the vision. You want to partner with it? Great. If you don't, that's cool. God don't need your stinking money. He doesn't. He doesn't need anybody's money. Do you think God's up there saying, man, oh, man, they're supposed to close on this note in about a month. And, um, oh, man, they got to come about another 150 grand. And where's that going to come from? I said, look, first listen, just go ahead and draw it up. It'll be fine. I'm like, yeah, but where's the money come from? I said, I don't know. God already knows. I ain't worried about it. And they're just like, man, this dude's crazy. <laughs> Philip did not have a strategy, y'all. He obeyed God. Now, I want to make sure people don't walk out of here and misunderstand me. Obviously, you can tell by, we don't just say, okay, you know, whatever. We're just going to say whatever. And me just turn to a page and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach that today. I mean, there's a lot of prayer and a lot of counsel that goes into what goes on here. A lot. But man, oh man, we get so caught up in the details of life. And sometimes I want to ask other churches, man, would you rather John Maxwell or, or some of these crazy leaders to be walking around your halls or the Holy Spirit? That's why one of our values is total dependence. We are utterly and totally dependent on the Holy Spirit of God to move here. Period. I can't stress that enough how important that is. And here's the thing, you can't attribute any of this to anything other than God. Because you get to know me pretty quick. You know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Man, I figured say, someone say, no, you're not. Oh, anyway. oh, wow, okay, there you go. Someone said it. So anyway, here's a question. Why do you think Luke made the point about the unclean spirits and the lame being healed and differentiated those. You see, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. And I'll tell you exactly why he said that. Because it happened. And here's what some of you need to wrestle with. Did everything in here actually happen? It did. You gotta wrestle with that. Listen, these religious elite were being, they were furious. Like, why can we not get rid of this Jesus movement? What is going on? We've done everything by the book. The other thing I love is there's much joy. You got, you've got Jews bringing a message to the Sumerians, and there's much joy. Now, another person comes on the scene. His name is Simon. He is a magician. I have a hard time saying that. I was trying to say Simon the magician. The magician, my wife's like, yeah, you're gonna totally mess up that word. But Simon the magician, so here it is in verse nine. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. So Simon was saying that he himself was somebody great. <clears throat> verse 10, they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest. So in other words, from the slaves to the rich people saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed him with his magic. Okay, here's what we know about Simon so far. He had a ton of influence. He somehow had the ability to do something that the general public perceived as magic, as what miraculous. We know that. But here's the thing. The people were coming to him for an answer that wasn't gonna help them. How prevalent is that today? Man, let me, let me tell y'all something. <laughs> I played the rat race for years about making money. I did for years, 17 years, trying to make as much money as I possibly could so I could retire when I was 50. And here's the thing, man, man, don't make, don't make your, your jobs or your career an idol. Man, don't. It's not going to get you joy. It may get you temporary happiness. It's not going to bring you joy. It's not going to bring you peace. It's not. And there's so many pitiful people who try to medicate with things that they think will help them deal with pain or suffering or help their lives be better. Listen, there's only one thing, and that's Jesus. I promise you. I've, I mean, I've never done hardcore drugs, but, man, I try to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And I did it a long time ago, over a decade ago. I had an issue with, with alcohol. 
But man, oh man, none of, that's all got a horrible dead end. And that's even with your spouse or your kids. You know, I love to joke about travel ball and dance moms, but it's a problem. Don't, don't make an idol anything. These people are idolizing someone that doesn't need to be idolized. But listen what happens. Listen what happens in verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon's losing his status. Simon's losing his influence. So we saw a couple weeks ago, if you can't beat them, you either cheat them, which is what the, what the Sanhedrin did with making up false witnesses against Stephen. Remember that? Or you what? You join them. So listen what happens in verse 13. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Now, based on that one sentence, we think, oh, he's a follower of Jesus. He's saved. Get ready. And seeing great signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Scripture says, Luke tells us right here, he believed and he continued with Philip because he was amazed. He was, he was fascinated. He made a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He did. Okay? Listen, folks, I'm gonna say it. I get flack for it. Words don't save you. They don't. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Now, here's the part where, where I need everybody to open their eyes because we've had, there's been a lot of disagreements throughout the years on this next passage of Scripture we're getting ready to cover, okay? Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. So basically, the two, two of the big hitters of the apostles, Peter and John. Peter the rock and, and the beloved John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what? For he had not yet fallen on any of them but they had only been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, you guys know me well enough to know I, I don't get into theological stuff because I, I just, I see it ripping churches apart. I, I, I don't understand the whole denominational thing. I, I don't, it's Jesus Christ, him crucified. And I think the church ha, has just made a mockery out of it with fighting over stuff that's not gonna make any difference in eternity. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna get to heaven and I'm gonna have a lot of stuff wrong. A lot. And so are you, okay? But here's the deal. I did a, I, I was like, okay, so, you know, you got this whole uh, basically reformed, um, and some of you may not know what that means, count yourself blessed, but you got this whole reform movement that's like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, you got the spirit and everything else. And so it's, a, it's, it's just this. And then you got the charismatic movement, which means there could be a laying on of hands to impart the Holy Spirit. And this is the proof text that they use to justify that. So you're like, okay, Nathan, do you believe that? I absolutely do not, period. When, when someone truly repents, place 100% of their faith and joy in Jesus Christ, they are saved and they are then gathered with 100% of the Holy Spirit. Just like that. They are a new creation. You're like, well, what about this? Okay, all right, come, I'm gonna get to it. All right, so for thousands of years, God was only for the Jews. He was only for the Jewish nation, always. God made that abundantly clear about 17, 1800 years prior to this with a guy named Abraham. Abundantly clear. At eight days old, you're to circumcise all the men, and if they're not, you cannot be in my family, period. The, 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 the God of Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament was only for the Jewish nation. So here's what happened. When the apostles, the men who spent the time with Jesus, when they heard that all of a sudden the Sumerians had received the gospel, they had to go check it out. And here's what God did. See, one thing I didn't denote with the Sumerians is they did believe in God. <clears throat> they did think a Messiah was coming. They only agreed with the first five books of the Old Testament. They didn't believe anything the prophets, none of that. Only Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's it, okay? And they, they did want a Messiah. They hated the temple in Jerusalem and built their own temple. So here's what would have happened had all of a sudden the apostles not gone there and placed their authority on it you would have literally had two very distinct churches day one. And so basically a very rare 
and unique event requires an exception. So the apostles go, because here's the thing, the Samaritans also need affirmation. Listen, you're part of the pillars of the church now. We're going to literally affirm that with the apostles traveling 40 miles from Jerusalem. And imagine John and Peter's schedule. <clears throat> imagine their schedule. They're trying to keep their church alive, literally. And so here's the other thing. We also know that scripture will never contradict scripture. Here's a word of advice. If you ever come to a part of scripture that you don't understand, the first place you go is other scripture. Now look what Paul tells the church in Galatia. He says in 3.2, let me ask you only this, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul made it clear. And then again, just a few more verses in verse 14, he says this, so that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. We're not even to the Gentiles yet. We're still in Samaria. So that we might receive the promised spirit through what? Through faith. True faith, true repentance, and bam, you have the, there is no laying on of hands to impart the Holy Spirit anymore. There isn't. You don't see that as a spiritual gift. People do not have that power any longer. And listen, if you wanna talk about it afterwards, we can. I'm not gonna get into it up here because here we're about Jesus, okay? But that's, that had to be demonstrated that the Samaritans, that they had become members of the Yahweh church, the Old Testament church that was fulfilled in Jesus. And again, an unprecedented situation demands a quite exceptional activity with the apostles going to do that. And so that's, that's and here's the other thing. We're gonna learn in chapter 11, when the Gentiles receive the spirit, Peter's involved with that. And Peter, go, Peter goes back to Jerusalem to the council to make sure he lets them know that. And then just a few verses later, a guy named Barnabas, he goes to the church in Antioch to make sure he qualifies it. So again, it's, it's very hard to truly grasp this without understanding how Samaria and Jews, the Jews in Jerusalem were such different people that claimed to worship the one true God. And God made sure when my church first starts out, it's gonna start out on a single foot. And here's the thing, look at all the splinter denominations and everything that's come out. And I don't wanna call it, listen, I, I agree with a ton of my different brothers and sisters in Christ from different denominations. And yeah, we don't agree on everything, we agree on the main thing. And that's what we gotta make sure we get back to. That's what God's trying to teach us here, agree on the main thing. And that's why some of you have come to me and you've asked me about some theology. And I, Listen, if I offend you, I'll repent. But I just, listen, we gotta keep the main thing the main thing, y'all. We've got to. We're all gonna get to heaven and we're all gonna have it wrong. Paul said, all I wanna know amongst you is Christ and him crucified. Keep the main thing the main thing. And there's the other thing. They were one body and one spirit. That's what made sure God wanted to make sure. Look at Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It says this, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And look what Paul says here, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Now, if anyone's got any questions about what I just said, come see me after service, okay? Fill out a care card. I got no problem talking through it with you. All right, verse 18, <clears throat> Simon's like, ooh, okay. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. <whistles> to Simon, this was a dazzling display of power, unlike anything he had ever seen before. And here's the thing, power was Simon's narcotic. Is it yours? Is it yours? Well, if I can just get that promotion. Well, if I can just make that extra whatever. Well, if we can just have that, things will be good. Listen, you're, when you say that, you'll never have enough. Trust me, I tried it for 17 years. Kelly, I can remember telling Kelly, Kelly, honey, when we get a lake house and we get all our stuff paid for, then I'll be willing to give to the church. That's what I said. Thank God he didn't allow me to get a lake house because that would have been such a financial burden on my family. That's what I said. 
And before that, it was everything else. Well, I get this Lexus paid off and it'll be all right. We'll get our house paid down, refinance, where payment's a little less, it'll be all right. And I'll give the church. Listen, where is Jesus in your life if you claim to be a follower of him? Just don't claim to be a follower of him. I'm cool. But don't tell me you follow Jesus and then have to put all these other things above him. Please. And here's the other thing. Simon didn't pray to receive the Holy Spirit. He prayed for the power to bestow it at his will. Big difference. And here's the thing. It's where a term called simony comes from, where the Roman Catholic Church will sell offices. That's why the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest landowner in the world because they would, they would take stuff to get people out of purgatory or to help them have a better life or forgive people or condone things or sell Catholic offices. And again, I'm not here to, again, I'm not here, I'm just, I'm, I'm literally saying where the term simony came from was from Simon because he wanted to buy that. His pride was undeniable. And let me tell you something, y'all, God hates pride. He hates it. He absolutely hates pride. I literally, I just picked a handful of verses from scripture. We're gonna go through them super quick so you can write them down. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. What is evil? Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. James, the half-brother of Jesus, the first book written in the New Testament chronologically, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, we've read a little bit about Peter. What do you think his reaction was to this? Oh, well, you know, 30 piece of silver, we can work something out. Shoot, yeah, I got some debt over here. Yeah, we'll work something out. No. Look what he said in verse 20. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could attain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Just so you know, the, the kind of literal translation that, that Peter says right here it is, may your money and you go to destruction. In other words, honestly, in our terms, he was saying to hell with you and your money. That's what he was saying. That is exactly what he was saying. Peter was 100% righteously furious with Simon for wanting more power and more prestige and trying to buy the gift of God, which by the way is free. And that's, that's the part. And here's the thing, folks. Obviously, his baptism didn't save him, did it? Obviously, it did not. His baptism didn't save him. His belief did not save him. Now, what do you think the, first, the next word out of Simon is? His MO, every single time he has preached, whether it's been to people at Pentecost or to the religious elite, he always says one word beforehand. Look in verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. <sighs> Listen, folks, I say it a hundred times, repentance. It's something that's not said in church right now because it's not pithy. They don't like to hear it. That's the first thing the, the, the apostles always said. It's the first thing Jesus said. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. God looks at the heart. He looks at our hearts. He does not look at other things at what people may see. He looks at our hearts. The gall of bitterness that Peter says there, it, it implies a bitter poison that's within him. That's, that's kind of the original language that he used. And, and the funny thing is the same type of language in Hebrew that they used to describe people in Deuteronomy that worship false gods. And they were literally, they were just disgusting and absolutely bitter poison. Listen, what's other gods? It's anything you put in front of Jesus. That's what it is. Here's the thing. He, it needs to be extracted out of him. What, what, are, what are you holding on to that's bitterness or unforgiveness? What are you holding on to that needs to get extracted from you? The only thing that's going to be able to extract it is the grace of God in Christ Jesus. That's it. 
I love what Paul says to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 7, 9. He says this, add it is, I rejoice. Not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For a godly grief produces a repentance that leads to what? Salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces what? Death. Grieved into repenting, it led to salvation. So then, so what does Simon say to Peter? He still doesn't get it. Listen to what he says in verse 24. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing what you have said may come upon me. He wants Peter to pray for him that he doesn't get hurt. Peter just got through telling him, your heart's wrong. You're in the, you have the gall of bitterness. You're in the, the bond of iniquity. He tells him everything, and he tells him exactly what to do, repent. Repent is basically when you change your mind about something, and it changes the actions of your, of your body. When you have a complete change of mind, that is repentance. He didn't even pray for forgiveness. He didn't. He didn't get it. And he asked Peter to do all the praying for him. It's crazy. And here's the thing. His desire was to escape the consequences rather than to amend his life. Man, I, there was no repentance there. And just in typical fashion, let me tell you what the apostles did. They didn't spend a lot of time on him. Look at the very next verse. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. Now, this is a cool part right here. This is the apostles. Preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now, I've said it before. There's two ways to get from Samaria to Jerusalem. And the way they took would have been the, the southern route, which would have been a lot more treacherous, but it went through a lot more Samarian villages. Would have been the same path Jesus had his disciples take when he met the woman at the well. Imagine them saying, man, we just met the apostles. And then when that church that was there that got planned, God raised up someone, met the other church at the city where Simon was, and they came together. Imagine the reunion. It's amazing how God works all this out. But here's the thing, back, back to Simon. With, with the repentance. Listen, every time Peter preached in Acts, he talks about it, okay? I talk about it a lot. Y'all are probably sick and tired of hearing it. You're, I'm not gonna stop saying it. And here's the thing. Jesus was baptized, and then Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, okay? Right after that, he begins his ministry. Take a wild guess what the first word out of his mouth is when he starts his ministry. Repent. Luke 13, 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Listen, one of the most fearful realities in all of Scripture is that some people who think they're saved, they're not. It terrifies me. People said, Nathan, what's your hardest job as a pastor? It's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to a room, and I think people are going, yeah, amen, 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 but it might be a bunch of Simons in here. That's the part that just, it scares me. It terrifies me. Because I can't look into anyone's heart and know if they're saved. I don't have any powers. I don't. But it scares me to death to think that someone comes here or another church every single Sunday and they are on their way to the pits of hell, eternally separated from God. It scares me to death. Like they think they're on their way to the gates of heaven and they understand that there's an entrance to hell right down here from them and they're going this way. And Jesus talks about this all the time. Scariest verse of scripture in all the Bible. My opinion, Matthew 7. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, when are the kingdom of heaven? But the one who, what? Does the will of my father who is in heaven. This is Jesus talking. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? I can just imagine Simon saying this and look what Jesus says. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Wow. <sighs> Guys, this is heavy. Simon literally thought he was saved. And until you read the next couple of verses, we think he's saved. So he believed and got baptized. We're talking about eternity. Those who fail to see themselves as sinners will see no need for a savior. 
It's the divine transformation of the heart. Listen, there's some, there's some things that Simon didn't have. <clears throat> he had a lot of things going for him, but he didn't have authenticity. And there's several things. Simon had no authentic, number one, repentance. Again, I just said it. The first words when Jesus started his ministry in Matthew 4, 17, he said this. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And again, the Greek there is a complete change of mind that changes how you act, how you speak, where you go. I've talked to probably three or four different people. And here's the thing, I'm, I'm not proud of my past, but I've got a playlist on Spotify that's got about 50 or 55 worship songs. That is all I listen to. That's it. It's not because listening to secular music is a sin. For me, it is. For me, it is, because when I listen to some of those songs, it takes me back to the stupid stuff I did before I knew Jesus. And guess what I'm doing? I'm remembering that and I'm just sinning. So I only put things in my body that's wise. Again, don't ask the question, is it right or wrong? If you don't know something's right or wrong, we need to talk after this. Ask, is it wise? Anything you're getting ready to do, is it wise if I do this? Is it wise if I chew that person out? Is it wise if I call that person that name? Is it wise if I go to that place? That's what we gotta do. And here's the thing, that brings us to the next one. Simon had no authentic faith. He didn't. I love when Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus. He says this, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast. Listen, you can't pray enough. You can't read enough scripture. You can't give enough to the church. You can't give enough of your time or your money to get saved. Simon begged Peter to help him not have any consequences. And Peter's like, bro, uh, listen, may all you and all your stuff be damned. That's what Peter said to him, to the path of destruction. Simon had no authentic obedience. None. He had no authentic obedience. It's crazy. Jesus is teaching in a room one time. And Mary, his own mother, and his brothers were outside. And someone comes and says, hey, Rabbi, your mother and brothers are outside. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll be like, oh, okay, well, cool. Let's make some room. Let's get Mary and some people in here. What does Jesus say? He says in 821 of Luke, but he answered him, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and what? Do it. My man, I ain't coming back next week. Listen, I'm just, I'm, listen, I don't want us to be a bunch of Simons, y'all. Simon had no authentic conviction. He didn't. He had no authentic conviction. Listen, when, when, when I'm a, a poop head, that's what I'll say up here, to my wife, I feel terrible about it. Or, or if I say something wrong to somebody, God convicts me of it. He does, he convicts me of it. It's like John, 1 John 8 and 9, he says this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Uh, do, do you have conviction? Not shame, shame's from Satan. Don't you be ashamed of anything. You are literally God's work of art when you come to Christ Jesus and nothing can change that. Absolutely nothing. And nothing can separate you from the love of God either. Absolutely nothing. I don't care what you come in here with. Jesus is, is here with arms wide open. Right now, arms wide open. I don't care what you looked at last night. I don't care what you did. It doesn't matter. Nothing can escape the love of God in Christ Jesus. But you gotta go through these steps. <clears throat> Simon had no authentic sanctification. And you're like, what in the world is that? Sanctification is basically this. I, I, I came to Christ roughly when I was 34 years old. I'm 46 now. That's 11 years, okay? When I came to Christ, and here's the thing, I, I don't know the exact day. I don't. But when I came to Christ, I was immediately justified. I was justified to God in Christ Jesus, not because of anything I did, but because Christ, the Holy Spirit called me, I submitted, I repented, I, was, I realized my sin, and I was like, oh my goodness, I gotta have a daggum savior. And this, really what did it for me was this was all true, because I had done a ton of research. This was all true, and I'm like, my goodness. 
And so I put my faith in Jesus. I was justified. When I die or when Jesus comes back, I will be made like Christ. I will then be glorified. So you've got justification, glorification. Everything in between is sanctification. Where you're trying to be more and more and more like Jesus. Each and every day. I mess up. I'm better than I was a year ago. But I'm not anywhere near where I need to be. And so that is, Simon didn't have any of that. None of it. He's like, oh, oh, Peter, man, when you pray and just have God not get mad at me, please, that's all I want. I don't want any consequences. I guess that wasn't that funny, sorry. But anyway, it's trying to lighten the mood a little bit. He, hadn't, he didn't, he didn't have any of that. And here's the thing, Paul's writing the church in Philippi and he talks about this. He says in Philippians 1, 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. We are all on this journey together. Those of us who are true, authentic followers of Jesus, we're on this journey to try to do better. I've had countless conversations this week with several different people where they are trying to do better by abiding in Jesus. They are trying to be more like Christ in all that they do. And lastly, Simon had no authentic love. He had no authentic love. And again, the apostle John makes this abundantly clear. In his first letter, 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love <laughs> doesn't know God because God is love. Do you love? Do you love? Truly love. And, and the type of love he's talking about there, the Greek is agape. And, and it's a new term that they had to come up with to describe the love of Jesus because the easiest way I can describe it, it's an unconquerable benevolence that no matter what you do to me, I'm gonna sincerely love you. No matter what you do to me, I'm going to sincerely love you. It is literally an unconquerable benevolence is what it is. It's a love that is rooted in Christ, not in anything in the world. And Jesus talks about this. So when the religious leader trying to figure out, okay, what do you gotta do to, to enter the, the kingdom and everything else, and Jesus going back and forth, he finally says in Matthew 22, he says this, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. By the way, your neighbor's everybody. It's everybody but you. Doesn't matter their choices. Doesn't matter their political affiliation. Doesn't matter what they believe. And I want to put this last slide back up here with the question that every one of us need to ask. Do I have authentic repentance? Do I understand, man, I, I, I'm a sinner. I am in need of a savior. Listen, I, repeating words after another man does not get you saved. I cringe. I cringe when people say, hey, just repeat after me. God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need you to save me. And then them say, if you just prayed that, you're saved. No, it's not, it's not anywhere in here. It's not. Now, I'm not saying you can't be saved by that. You absolutely can. But just because you prayed it does not make, necessarily make you saved. There is a radical transformation of the heart in Christ Jesus. And we're talking about eternity. Eternity is what we're talking about. Simon didn't get it. And unless something drastically changed with Simon, he is literally wailing and gnashing his teeth right now. 2,000 years later. One of the most prestigious people, probably the most prestigious guy in that city in Samaria is wailing and gnashing his teeth right now in the pits of hell separated from God. I prayed before I taught this because I'm like, man, oh man, ain't no one going to want to hear this. But we got to search our hearts. Peter told Simon his problem was his heart was not right. Do you have authentic faith and obedience? Because those two go together. Listen, God's going to tell everybody in here. Like I said last week, you're called. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to do something. I don't know what that is. Here's what I do know. It won't contradict this, and it will glorify God, and it will bring you joy, and it will bring you peace. That's what I know. Doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. Doesn't mean it's not going to sting. Doesn't mean you're going to be in a hospital six different times in four years wondering if your kid's going to live and hearing the wailing of moms that have lost their kids, which is what's happened to me several times. Doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. I wouldn't trade it for nothing, though. I wouldn't. 
Because I didn't do anything to deserve that. Obedience, conviction. Do you just constantly do stuff you know you're not supposed to do and feel no conviction from it? Come and talk to one of our one of us men. Come talk to one of our brothers. Ladies, we got a ton of sisters in here that would love to do life with you. It's our honor to do it. Are you being sanctified? Are you, are, you, are you starting to fall in love with Jesus every single morning? And then do you love? Do you love? Do you love your neighbor? These are all evidences of a follower of Jesus. Listen, I wanna make sure I'm clear. It's not works. We read that, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is of the grace of God that we're saved. It's not of works, but when you do get saved, one of my favorite verses, and I just thought of it, that I always say during mic check is Ephesians 2.10. Right after those verses, he said, we are God's workmanship. That Greek word is poema, work of art, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Bible's clear. What's your fruit? Because that's evidence. If you don't know that you know, for the love, fill out a care card. I'm not going to ask someone to raise their hand. I'm not going to ask anybody to come down here. I'm not going to do that. Fill out a care card. Or if you know somebody that you know that's not saved, put their name on a care card so our prayer team can pray for them. I mean, if you got somebody that's got cancer, would you put them on a care card? For us to pray for their healing? Well, my goodness, cancer is nothing compared to what we're talking about. It's nothing. And I wish people would, would I, I, I hate that this has been a, a heavy message, but man, I don't want to have a bunch of Simons at Hendersonville Church. I don't. Listen, if you're here and you think Jesus is a phony, that's cool. Man, I want to take you to coffee or lunch or whatever. And man, just shoot the bull with you. If you don't believe this, you think, man, there's no way. I don't believe that stuff. That's fine. I, man, I love you. I want to talk with you. And if you're a female, then I've got somebody else that can meet with you or my wife and I can go with you. That's great. We love you here. I would love to talk to you about Jesus if you don't believe him. That's okay. But man, if you're here and you're like, man, Nathan, I'm a follower of Jesus and I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. Okay, well, well, that's good. Do you love? Do you feel conviction? Are you being sanctified? Man, this, this is heavy. This is heavy. Don't walk out of here without filling out that care card. We're talking about eternal. Some of my closest friends, two weeks ago, their dad was fine on this planet, not expecting anything. And they buried him yesterday. Ironically enough, the last thing I heard from that man was, hey, Nathan, always make the main thing the main thing. It's the last words he told me. Jesus, Jesus, we're talking about eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for what your word has taught us today. God's text is hard for more reasons than 10. God, I just... I fear so bad, and I know other pastors do too, about how many people think they're on their way to heaven and they're not. God, I, just, I beg you, I'm begging you right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, that you would just, if someone's got a question, God, that they would either call me this week or Ryan God, or they would fill out a care card or God, they could go fill out one of our confidential care cards online that only comes to me or Ryan. So God, we can just talk to them about this man named Jesus. And God, obviously, if there's anyone in here who thinks Jesus is a phony, who thinks Christians are a joke, who thinks we're all just a bunch of hypocrites, that, that's cool, that's fine. God, just have them come to me and, and challenge me and, and allow me the opportunity to give a defense for what I believe. God, your word says you don't, you don't desire anybody 
to be eternally separated from you in a place called hell. God, I'm just, I'm just begging you that people will fill out a care card either for themselves or if they have a loved one they want us to pray for. Because God, we've seen prayer just move so big here where people have done just that and people show up here and then people miraculously are called by the Holy Spirit into repentance. God, and they become my brother or my sister in Christ. Because God, when you start praying scary prayers like do whatever it takes to bring so-and-so to you, do whatever it takes, God. God, you're faithful. Holy Spirit, I just pray again that you will absolutely put a weight on the people in here that's so heavy they physically cannot get out of their chair. And we're going to give you all the glory and we're going to give you all, all the honor because it's got nothing to do with us. We love you. It's in that matchless, precious, holy name, that name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.